We're conducting interview with Mr. Edmund de Waal. My name is Bea Lefkowitz and we are at the Austrian Embassy in London. Thank you so much, Edmund de Waal, for agreeing to be interviewed for the Next Generation Collection of the AGR Refugee Voices Archive. It's a huge pleasure and privilege to be here with you. Thank you so much. Um, as you are somebody who is very interested in buildings and places, and we're here at the Austrian Embassy today on the anniversary of the first kinder transport leaving Germany, celebrating the 80th anniversary of the Association of Jewish Refugees, and also on the lighting of the fourth can candle for the Festival of Hanukkah, I wanted to start asking you how do you feel about being here in this building? I feel very good about being in this building. That's quite a journey to being feeling welcomed in this building. Um, the last time I was in this building was to hand over, in its entirety, um, my family archive, the Afrusi family archive, a Viennese Jewish family archive, which I'd inherited. Photographs, letters, artworks, uh, and I handed it over here to be taken through the good offices of the ambassador to the Jewish Museum in Vienna. So I've, I've been on quite a long journey over the last 30 years in order to be able to feel that this is a place of, of welcome and, and, a, and a place of transition for me. And you, you wanted it to go back to Vienna, or to Vienna? Yeah, so that's an interesting thing because I mean, that takes you very much into the heart of so many conversations. <laughs> but one of the conversations that it is about is where where do stories belong uh, belong, and where can stories best be told? And my brothers and I and my children were very involved in this decision and we decided that actually our own family story, our, the Afrusi family story, was best and most powerfully told in Vienna rather than it being in, in my attic in uh, London, here in London. So it could, it could work harder in Vienna. Uh, and that's why we made that decision. And it's a huge emotional decision to give across a family archive. But that's what we did. So that's why that archive went back to Vienna. And of course, because the archive went back to Vienna, to the Jewish Museum, they put on an exhibition a couple of years ago, 2019. And that allowed all our family from all the way around the world to come back to Vienna the opening of that exhibition. So lots of things roll from one thing to another to another. Yeah, maybe because there isn't a centre. I mean, other, other second, third generation have this problem, you know, what do they do with family archives? Where do they put them? And, you know, is it... Yeah, it's a very particular problem. It was a very particular sort of situation, I think, for us, in the, only in the sense that because I'd written a book about the family, I, I'd already relocated the family. I sort of said, this is our family and we belong, you know, here in Britain and in America and Mexico and Japan and Vienna and Paris and Odessa. You know, we belong all these different places. I'd already written the book. In that case, so in that case, actually having the, the archive, this, these boxes and boxes of material, some of it very beautiful and special going back to the 18th century, in some ways, I could let that go. I didn't need to hand that on to my children because we'd... The third generation, I think. <laughs> because I'd already handed the story out into the yeah. world. So I'd already done that one thing. It is hugely difficult and painful for families. I mean, I, as you can imagine, I, people talk to me all the time and share their stories with me about what they have, these, these sometimes very few things and where they belong and, and the objects or the photographs or the one letter or are, are enormously, enormously powerful, freighted with emotion and power. And then what do they do with it? You know, where does it belong? How can they pass it on? So um, we can talk about this yeah. for hours. You were ready, you were ready but you I was said ready. something interesting. Uh, which is important, whether, do you consider yourself second or third generation? Because that's an interesting question. I have no idea anymore, because, of course, uh, my dad came here in 30, um, um, 39. 39, yes. Um, 
So in that sense, I'm second generation. Um, but of course, I was so close to my grandmother and my great uncle, who gave me their stories. That in some ways, I'm third generation. Yeah. And I'm, I'm in, I'm, and I, and because I, because I write about, because I, I don't write history. I write about about what about. Um, it's a slightly different way. I don't because I don't. I don't think of myself as a historian. I think of myself as a storyteller of what of what it is to be na- a person now holding these stories. I think I'm first generation because <laughs> I'm living yeah. and talking about these things that it's happened. From your lens, from yes, your exactly, exactly. So I'm not quite sure which generation I'm in. Mm-hmm. That's an open yeah, question. It's a, yeah. um, you have written extensively about your family background in the air with Amber, hair with Amber eyes, and also recently in the letters to. Commando, it's also, there's a lot of personal uh, history in there. But maybe just for the purpose of yeah. the interviews, yeah. let's assume that the viewer hasn't read your books. Okay. So maybe just tell us a little bit about your family background and also about the journey, uh, which you have already mentioned, but a little bit more about the journey it has taken to discover your family history. So the short, short version is that I come from a Jewish family that came from Odessa. Um, and moved to Paris and Vienna in the middle of the 19th century, uh, bankers and merchants, and had so had t- t- family divided, Jewish families, married Jewish into other Jewish families, dynastic, so lots of ambition, um, uh, and in Paris, art collecting and all that kind of fashionable stuff, and in Vienna on the Ringstrasse, big palais full of art. Um, and and really, the story is really about um, uh, about diaspora. It's about it's about what happened to the family um, at the Anschluss in Vienna uh, when my great grandparents' house was completely um, ransacked, and they, they, uh, um, and um, they were. Like, cameras were beaten up and um, and threatened and uh, they managed to um, escape to Czechoslovakia where my great grandmother uh, took her in life my great grandfather finally arrived in England in 39 as did my grandmother and my father uncle uh, the family is completely spread out all over the world complete diaspora and I tell the story through the lens to use your word, of a collection. I inherited a collection of Japanese objects, netsuke, little tiny things, that I was given by my great uncle Iggy Ignace Leo Afusi, uh, who'd ended up in Tokyo. And I'm a potter, I was in Tokyo as a young man working there. And I got to know him, got to know this collection. And when he died, I inherited this collection. And I trace the family story back through handling this collection. And the story begins in Paris, where they were acquired by a cousin and given to my family in Vienna. And they survived the war in an extraordinary way by being hidden. And then after the war, it was inherited by Iggy and then by me. So six generations of the family. Um, so the journey to discover the story is a journey um, through touch, through handling objects. It's a journey into archives in Paris, Vienna, Odessa, everywhere else. Uh, it's a journey into what I was told by my grandmother and by my great uncle. But the heart of it is something completely different. The heart of it is trying to understand my father who arrives as a young boy here in, in England and doesn't talk about what happened. So I write a very personal book. This is a story you will know from so many of your hundreds of interviews. I write a very personal book in order to try and work out why my father wouldn't talk about his childhood. That's why I write it, not for any other reason, not for any other reason at all. Um, 
And the answer is it works. I write it, I give it to him, and he starts to talk. You know. He has started to talk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the book does a completely miraculous thing, which is to take him back to Vienna. Um, and there was an occasion um, when I, I, I did a book launch in the Palais of Russie, the family house in Vienna, uh, 11 years ago. And um, my father's there and my family are there. And I talk about this, is an act, this whole story as an act of restitution, of bringing the family back to Vienna. And after I've done my speech, I see my dad take my two sons off by the hands, the young boys, up a staircase. So, you know, you, can, you can't work out quite where stories are going to take you. You know this, or what they'll do, or they won't do. The painful thing is that sometimes stories can't unlock anything. You know, they just are just painful. They just hold pain. I think the unbelievably extraordinary thing about for me and our, my family is that somehow by writing this book, it sort of unlocked a possibility of connections, generational connections, in a way that I would never have imagined. That's a fantastic thing. I mean, I think often sometimes survivors, refugees, they find they couldn't talk only if there's a sort of discourse around. Yeah. So in a way, a yeah. book or a testimony or film can pro provide that. You know, but um, you said your grandmother mm -hmm. talked and her brother. Mm -hmm. So how did it... How? So that, that, that happens in interesting ways. So my grandmother, Elizabeth, who was this wonderful, dynamic, she was a writer, a philosopher, lawyer, first woman lawyer in, in Vienna. And I was very fond of her. She was very, we were very fond of each other. Because she was a poet. And as a child, I wrote poetry all the time. I used to send her poems, and she used to critique them because she's a Jewish grandmother and send them back to me and send me books of poetry. And in fact, I discovered later on, of course, that she was a friend of Rilke. I mean, extraordinary. But we had this great connection. And then she told me about Vienna through, absolutely through, about literature. That was a great friendship and lovely. And I knew, but then my great uncle, I, it was a miracle because I was there in Tokyo in, in his late eighties. Um, and I used to go and spend my afternoons when I wasn't making pots with him and he was at that amazing moment in someone's life when you're sort of you're sort of living you're living in two worlds you're living and he would so he would extraordinarily vividly talk about um life before the first world war or that or what it was like like to walk down to the to the, the the theatre in the evenings from, from their house, or the anti-Semitic protests at the university across the road, or, you know, how his father, who was a banker, used to go to work with their butler across the road to the shop. All these extraordinary details, because it was almost like I was, you know, someone who'd know it all. And, and so I kind of had this extraordinary experience. I didn't take notes, but just of hearing with enormous beauty and vigour and pain, all this stuff. And then he gave me this collection. And he gives me this collection, and it's like, what's he giving me here? You know, they're beautiful, they're special to him, they were the only bit of the f family sort of, what survived, materially. But he's also giving me a, um, a challenge, you know, a responsibility. A responsibility. Uh, and again, this idea of responsibility for stories, you know, is something that you will have heard. is is so complicated for people. What, you know, what, how do I hand it on? Correct. Like what to do with... What with do you do? With the non-stories, the silence. The silence. Yeah. You know, what to do with it. Um, 
when reading your books and trying to understand your thinking around yeah. objects and memory, for me, notions of sort of fragments, traces, mm. scatter, dispersion mm. seem important. Mm. Um, in a way, so again, I want to ask you how you think that this affected your upbringing. I mean, you mentioned already mm. sort of your father not talking about it. How, in other ways, did you feel that impact? Well, I had the strangest upbringing. Because I grew up because my father had converted and become a Christian minister, Anglican minister, and become the Dean of Canterbury. So we grew up in the Church of England, in cathedrals, you know, with this sort of non-talked-about, non-stated Jewish continental background. So in that sense, the sort of idea of the, the trace of trying to find anything, you know, um, and, and uh, you know, uh, became really important to me. I mean, it's it led it, it's 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 both both a, a somatic thing, a haptic thing, because because I use my hands. Yeah. I mean, I'm waving them around at the moment. <laughs> you know, so so actually, how how things how you find things in the world is very much for me. Whether it's a you know a, a record in the, um, in the in the Jewish records in Vienna or a library book or a a letter or, or an object or a building, everything has to be touched. As soon as you say that, of course, you're in that whole business about what's present, what's erased yeah. um, or effaced, uh, what's fragmentary, as you say, what's a palimpsest, what's been written over, um, where there are pages which have been ripped out, where there are things which have been very painfully written over. Um, obviously in the Jewish records. So, you know, all these things are, are ways of understanding um, the, 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 the evidence of the world, you know, the evidence of, of, of the stories of, 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 of families. Was there a moment in your childhood where you realised, oh, we, we are slightly different, I'm slightly different, or you see what I mean? Was there a sort of... I think we had such a strange upbringing. I think it was... Um, no, I don't think there was a particular moment, um, though it, um, it's pretty odd to hear your father with a strong, strong accent, you know, preaching in a, in a cathedral with an enormous rolling R, R, as if he's, you know, just walked out of a Viennese coffee house. So, you know, um, it's... And, and there was a great moment when his portrait was painted for, for Canterbury Cathedral by his cousin, Marie-Louise von Montaschitzky, who was a Viennese yeah, painter, yeah. cousin of yeah. ours. Um, and she painted him as a rabbi. <laughs> you know, so... Because I actually saw, he, she, mentioned, uh, she mentioned in her memoirs, it's really upon, a reference to your great-uncle. Yeah. Were they friends? Or, uh, they were all friends. Yeah. They were all yeah. grew up together, and mm. in fact, Canetti, who was Mary Louise's partner for a long time, yeah. saw the picture of my dad and said, "This is this is a very troubled man." There's a wonderful letter from Canetti, looking at the portrait of my father, going, "This man is a very very troubled man. He doesn't know where he belongs." And what did your father think of the portrait? Well, he's grown to love it, but it's taken him thirty years. Very interesting. Um, when discussing the experience of second and third generation, you know, survivors mm -hmm. and refugees, often the dynamics of the silences mm -hmm. within them yeah. seems so important. Yeah. Um, and again, you've mentioned this already. Mm -hmm. Were there occasions, or you know, where the silences you said was the broken, or where you know, I just yeah. Or maybe don't call it silence, maybe it isn't a silence, maybe it's just a sort of... I mean, I, I, you know, I know so many families where the silences have been very... Um, have been um, extremely painful and often quite destructive. Um, there was certainly any, any amount of avoidance of, of, of this in childhood. Um, um, but at the same time, I, I, it, it didn't. It wasn't an inhibiting 
It wasn't an inhibiting silence. Um, I, um, it, it didn't, it, it, it didn't, it didn't prevent me or my siblings going off and doing things in the world. I think it's more, it's more um, a post hoc kind of um, understanding of. Well, actually, it's quite interesting because actually, my brothers have all gone off in different directions in the world. They've, you know, Africa, the Caucasus, wherever. We've all gone off into different directions. Um, just like my grandmother's generation went off in all different directions. Um, so there is there's definitely a, a dynamic there, which is quite an interesting one between us all. Um, but I think I think the the experience of of um, understanding in much much greater depth our Jewish family heritage um, um, has been extraordinary and 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 and, and, and positive. And within your family. Would you say often you know there's one person who takes this on who's particularly interested? Is it is that you? Or? It, 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 well, it's me and my brother Thomas. Tom, Tom, um, you should really interview my brother Tom, <laughs> because he um, is a Russian. He speaks Russian. He went to Odessa in the 80s. He, he's a great Caucasus expert, and he was doing research into the family in Odessa way before I was doing anything in Odessa. I was in Japan doing stuff. Right. So, you know, and he, he and I travelled together to Odessa to, to see particular parts of that, that, that story. Um, and so he has a very interesting take on it as well. I mean, um, quite often, I mean, there is someone who, who takes on the role of being you know, let's let's call them what they are, an archivist or a storyteller or a witness or, you know, um, or an inheritor. Um, and it can be in one generation, it can skip generations, it can go in all kinds of complicated ways. It's very rarely that you, that you don't find someone at some point who picks up on the silences or on the fragmentary bits of information there are or the anecdotes or that desperate intergenerational need to understand where people came from what, or what happened. So it, it can go in all kinds of ways and, and you can't legislate for who it will be who, who takes it on. One more thing on that yeah. is you can, never un, you can never underestimate. There's always someone listening. They might not know they're listening but there will always be someone in the family who's actually listening to what's, what's being said. Um, um, and you know, there's always someone. Mm. Yeah, you know, the, the scholar Marianne Hirsch talks about this post memory and she yeah. talks about this yeah. archival impulse of the yeah. second generation. Yeah. But again, it could be by the third generation. Or, you yeah. Know, it could be, you know, but it's that sort of thing to yeah. find things. And yeah, and there's a literature, obviously, of second yeah. generation writers. Um, you know, when we're all. Yeah. Share something that DNA. I think there's, you know, it's it's for, for better or worse. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel that in families who experience displacement and uprooting, the sort of objects which survived have more importance? And and you know, like when you inherited the, the I asked already, mm. you know, with yeah. Nets, the yeah. collection, whether you've yeah. got that responsibility really to to tell the story of. We absolutely yes. I mean, it's. Um, and of course, if, if, there's, if, there's, if, there's, if there isn't very much, it becomes very talismanic. It becomes a hugely powerful, potent object, you know, who, whose hands has it been through, how's it survived, you know, what's it witnessed, you know, where's it, where's it been? So it takes the place of a lot of, a, it, takes, it, is, it stands in for a huge amount of, of, of unknown experience. Um, and therefore, you read into it powerfully. I mean, it's, um, it's, it's it, you know, forget the rabbis. I mean, if you want to have really close examination of something, it's not a text; it's an object that's been handed on, you know, through families. The problem is the object can't tell the story itself. That's so often, you know, 
where, where's the information coming from? That yeah. She said, and often second, third generation yeah. have a problem, for example, they inherit photographs and yeah. they're not annotated. Yeah. How, do, how, do how on you earth do you, exactly. If you're lucky and your parents yeah. you know, mm. annotated it, then yeah. great, otherwise... Yeah. Otherwise, you have a photograph, and you have yeah. have these people, and you do not know who they are, exactly, or you, you know, or or you have an anecdote that says we came from Latvia, you know, or something. I mean, you know, there's something that sort of, you know, there's some something which is, you know, or so tangential that you cannot hook anything onto it. I mean, would you have any advice for some of these second, third generation people who you know, inherited now objects, documents, don't know what to do with it? I think as I get older, I have less and less advice because, <laughs> because it becomes more and more complex yeah. to, to, to work out, you know, the, the, what you've inherited. I think, I suppose the heart, the heart of it the heart of it is that you is it's that whether you have something or not, whether you have an object or you have a, you know a palais full of objects, or you know or you have a absolute silence, you 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 know that you are you are in an absolute throng of people who have who are, who, are, who are alongside you, you know you absolutely you are not alone in this experience. Of inheriting loss, of inheriting uh, the loss of, of of a connection, of a culture, of a neighbourhood, of a of 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 of, of, of the wealth of of, of 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 experience that that comes from 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 a, um, a family that can stay still. So you you. you you, you are not alone. That's the only thing you can say to people like that. And there are so many. And maybe I think it's interesting what you said, that you couldn't let go of the archive until you've done something yeah. with it. You see? Yeah. Maybe that's something to think about. What yeah. can you do with it? And then maybe yeah. then you can free yourself, or not free yourself, but then yeah. maybe yeah. Then anyone can do something. Yes. Um, but, but you see, one of the things is that... <laughs> One of the, as a parent now, I mean, my parents are now, my, my children are in their twenties. You know, there's this great, strong feeling that you, you don't want to pass on trauma. My dad didn't want to do it, so he was silent. I don't want to pass on an archive because it's full of beautiful things, but it's also full of absolutely heartbreaking letters and things about where where is everyone you know you don't want to you see you, you can't so you're trying to make sense of something for the next generation my dad becomes english you know becomes a clerk my uncle becomes a lawyer and you know you know they become more english than english they don't want to hand on that trauma here i am you know i know a bit about this but i don't hand on the stuff i've written a Book, that's enough of a millstone for my poor kids. I want to hand on all their, all those albums of letters as well. And you, the next is you also because I, I this is your disadvantages. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, you said you still had them in the family, but yeah. now you have actually. Given well, no, we've, them we've loaned them. You loaned. We loaned them to the Jewish Museum, but not all of them. Uh huh. So seventy-eight of them we sold for the refugee council. And we raised a huge amount of money. So this was three years ago. We decided that we were putting them all on a 10-year loan to the Jewish Museum in Vienna and decided to sell some of them to support unaccompanied refugee children. It's, you know, um, because, you know, we would not be here as a refugee family, a migre family, without the support of... of of organisations. So how, how did your father actually, how did they manage uh, to, get, to get into Britain? Um, it was really complicated. I mean, they got, um, my grandmother finally got a visa from Prague uh, through a 
family friend, someone who was working at the Foreign Office. It was really complicated. They got here in March 39. So they got here very, very much at the last minute. And it was a complicated way out. It was from, it wasn't from Austria, it was from, they were in Switzerland and then they went to Prague and then they got from here from Prague. Um, so they got a visa? They got a visa, yeah. Not on a domestic service? No, 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 it was a, they actually got a visa. Um, that's because my grandfather was Dutch and he managed to get here separately as well and so could prove that he could have he could support them here he wasn't jewish and he managed to get here in about six five months earlier i think it was tortuous i mean of course it was i managed to come in. i wanted to ask you about your grandmother elizabeth mm. she because she's written the book the the exiles return and you helped it to have it published posthumously mm. Why was it important for you? And that also connects me then to the, um, the Library of Exile, which you curated. Was, and is her book in it? Can it is, yeah, yeah. A little bit so, so, I mean, it's kind of what we all do, isn't it? We try and honour those, you know, those people we love. And my grandmother had written this novel about a Jewish academic going back to Vienna and the incredible difficulty and hostility with which they are faced. It's, it's not a great novel, but, it's a, it has, but it was rejected, you know, in the 50s completely by everyone. I sort of see why they wouldn't want to publish a novel about a Jewish academic going back to Vienna. No one wanted to know. So I kind of, you know, and it, I was thrilled that it got published here actually, and in, and in Austria, German. Um, I still want to publish, we've got the complete letters between her and Rilke, backwards and forwards, which I would love to get published one day. Um, so to give her a voice, or the mm, voice she didn't have? Or... Yeah, because there she was, she was an extraordinary person, you know, but you know, and she chose to live in Tunbridge Wells and not, you know, no one would have known about her life. It's a completely classic story of Happy Cray life. You know, she tries to disappear, you know, become sort of a housewife, really, in Tunbridge Wells. But, you know, if you looked at her bookshelves, you know, they're, you know, five languages, you know, the kind of this mind, this person, and 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 then the Library of Exile. Um, I just thought that the hostility, the toxic hostility to refugees that we have been seeing, and most horrifically over the last week of the death of so many in the, in the English Channel. It's you know it just continues. I just thought. What would it be to make a library where we brought together all the books in the world that we value, all of which are written by people who've crossed a border, written and been forced into exile because of their faith, because of their gender, because of their political beliefs, you know, and you, so you have, so I made this library, 2,000 books, 90 languages, um, and started in Vienna during the Biennale, Venice in the Biennale. Mm -hmm. And then it moved to Dresden, to the Japanische Palais, which was a library that, of course, had been destroyed in the bombing. Famous library where Victor Klemperer <laughs> used yeah. to write. And then came to the British Museum. And in each of the places, we had refugee groups, exile writers, dance, young people doing things. All the books you could read, you could write your name in them. Ex Libris. And then finally, when we finish the project, all the books have been donated to Mosul, University Library in Mosul, which they're rebuilding because it was destroyed by ISIS. And the structure of the library, the outside of the library, where, which was porcelain to which I'd written, is being um, re-erected in the Warburg 
library, which is another exiled library. So it's, you know, what, it, it's, what this brings us all full circle, because what this is about is, if you, if you, <laughs> what can you do? If you inherit something, what can you do with it? You know, what, you, you're given this thing. It's, it's, it's a family story, it's a, or it's a net, what, what, what's that respons what's the responsibility of that? You know, I wrote a book, you know, that's something. I was given a family story about, about being an exile. What can you do in the world to make a positive difference about, about celebrating and continuing to remember what it is to move across the border and leave your family behind? So it's, it's all one project, you know, on it goes. <laughs> So it's a very, but in a universal, or with the universalistic message with the Library of Exile, where you're looking at yeah, I mean, I, 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 across I, cultures. Across cultures. I mean, I, I, I put hundreds of my own books in, you know, Walter Benjamin, Ceylon, and all the kinds of... <laughs> by Jewish, Judith Kerr, I think. I, I, all the way to Judith Kerr. Yeah. But I also, you know, this is about agency, said if there is a book you feel that should be in the library, I will buy it which was a crazy thing to do, because by the time we'd finished, I'd had to buy about 3,000 <laughs> more books. But that's the point, which is that, you know, which is kind of why this whole process, talking to you today, is so wonderful, because you know, we're all in this together. You know, every story is utterly particular. You know, you must never, ever, ever patronise by, by presuming that there's anything other than complete singularity in every story. That's true. But then there's parallel and parallel and parallel. And on it goes, reverberating. On and on and on and on and on. So talking about stories, I yeah. wonder what your thoughts are about, for example, a testimony archive, mm. you know, such as ours, which is based on personal memories, recollections, silences. But it's all digital. Yeah. You know, we have no... Because we're talking yeah. about touching. Mm. So in our archive, there's nothing to touch. Yeah. It's all... I'm, 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 I'm grown up enough to know <laughs> that not everything <laughs> can be touched. <laughs> I think it's an incredible resource. I think it's absolutely fantastic resource. I completely applaud it. I think... I think it's... Its power will be felt in 20, 30, 50 years. I mean, you know, that's the extraordinary thing. Um, I, I love the fact that it's, you're expanding generationally. I think that's a wonderful thing to do. Um, it's f fascinating as well to know whether or not you sometimes interview different people from the same family because one of the great things I, I learnt, which you know, as this is a project you nurtured, is that you ha is that you hear from different people. You hear different refractions of the story. So interesting. Yeah. So siblings. Fa siblings. Yeah. You know, yeah. Siblings who survived in similar ways, completely different yeah. recollections, or mm. siblings first and mm. second generation. Yeah. 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 And it's it's it, and that's so important because it's. It's because it, that's that's they're all true. That's the point. Okay. Not, one's not more true. Not, they are all absolutely true and authentic. It's just you need to hear this sort of pol polyphonic yeah. thing about how stories come together. No, what I'm thinking when you talk about touching, mm. for me, what's important in archive are mm. the voices and the yeah. images, and because yeah. you know we have interviewed not many people not alive, and mm. that you can just go and then listen to them, yeah. and even if it's not your family members, mm. of course, as well, but other people that mm. and they are sort of mm. there, mm. and the accents are there, yeah. you know, that yeah. for me is yeah. sort of an extraordinary thing. Um, but I wanted to ask you also, has your own, how has your own identity changed? since you've written uh, The Heaven the Amber Eye. And you write in, in your last book, and I quote you, one can love more than one place. I think you can move across the border and still be a whole person. So how would you describe yourself in terms of your identity today? It's 
sitting here in the Austrian embassy. Yeah. Well, the sentence before that, I think, is why I say I'm a mongrel. I'm a quarter Dutch and quarter Austrian and half English, and I'm I'm sort of a bit Christian and lapsed Jewishness. I'm Quaker. I'm, um, you know, um, I think, you know, my my I think my identity is that I'm, you know, I I make things and I write books, I write stories, um, and I love my family, and, um, and I'm still trying to work out where I, where I am, really, and it gets more complicated, rather <laughs> less complicated, um, and, um, and that's not a bad thing, you know, I'm, it's not, it's not a, it's not a bad thing, it's, it's more that Perhaps the condition of a sort of homelessness is allows you to kind of to kind of tune into different places, actually, a bit more carefully. Um, having said that, I am applying for Austrian citizenship. And your father has already. My father has got it. Two of my brothers have got it. Um, my children are very keen to get it. Um, to um, what I didn't say just now <laughs> was that I have I'm finding it difficult to fill in a form uh, because I spent so many years looking at really painful forms in Vienna forms from of attempts to escape from Vienna uh, forms to um, forms from the Gestapo and from the, um, from uh, all the agencies who took over every single aspect of my family's life, death certificates, uh, the forms the um, in the in the synagogues where the, my grandparents' names are crossed out and renamed Sarah and Israel, etc., etc., and in Paris. So anything to do with a form, I find. <laughs> Fucking awful. Excuse my French. Um, so I'm finding it quite difficult, actually. Um, and I will apply for my citizenship, but I'm finding it really painful. It's not easy. No. Um, and of course, I'm, the concrete, of course, the concrete it's of putting the my, it's putting it all that down. <laughs> so I kind of avoid them if I can. And of course, my kids keep saying, "What? <laughs> what's holding you back?" So anyway, perhaps this. But you own archives in a way, all your yeah. research. Yeah. You, you've yeah. seen yeah. so much. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, we've not talked about, uh, in this interview, about the meaning of your work with, with porcelain, which mm. you write as a fragile mm. material. You call it also migratory <laughs> material, which I, I love the term. And maybe just tell us a little bit why you think you, that's uh, something which... Speaks to you. Well, it's been in my life for a very, very long time. You know, I've been a potter all my life, and porcelain for, you know, many, many decades now. Um, but there is something about, and, and porcelain, as, 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 as I say, is something that begins in one place, in China, and then it, it gets reinvented in Europe and in England, endlessly rethought and reinvented. So it is migratory, and it, then it moves back around the world. But its fragility is the important thing for me. And it's, you know, um, I work on the premise that porcelain doesn't survive intact, that it will break. And therefore you're dealing with shards, you're dealing with fragments, and it, you're immediately in this whole area of trying to understand a, 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 um, a partial survival of a story. You know, you pick up a broken pot, it's the partial survival of a story. You pick up a, a document which has been, you know, which is partially there, and you, you're on your way to, to beginning to reconstruct something. They have 
great kinship, porcelain, shards and paper. And in both cases, I mean, my archival principle, to use the phrase we keep coming back to today, yeah. is at work, really. Um, you know, and, 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 and an example of that, if we've got time, is, was, was my, I, I bought at auction um, a broken dinner set, Meissen dinner service, um, that had belonged to a Jewish family in Dresden. Had been stolen by the Nazis, and had been destroyed into fragments during the bombing of Dresden. I, I bought this at auction. It had been restituted to the family, mm. and I've spent a, a decade piecing it all back together again uh, with kintsugi, with this golden, this Japanese technique with an artist, put golden lines of lacquer to put it all back together again. So, you know, because this idea of kintsugi which is, for me, a very um, profound image, is um, that kintsugi isn't, isn't repair. You can't repair stories. You can't repair families. Think about, you, can mark, you can mark the places of loss. You can mark fracture. By marking them, then you have a new dynamic. You mark it, and you show something differently. So bring this dinner service back together again from this... Jewish family, Klemper family, you can see the damage, you can see the fracture, it's beautiful. You can see it, you can understand the story without having to talk about it. And that's very much like the kind of, the kind of narrative principle I work on. It's like don't, don't make it, don't pretend you can make it better, but you can reveal where the breakages happen. It's making something visible, isn't it? It's making something visible, yeah. Which is what you do when you interview people. Well, I'm just thinking about <laughs> so, it. I'm actually thinking about so, it because sometimes some people think an interview or a story makes, takes away, you know, fragments yeah. in a way it makes a whole. But it, that's not, I don't think that's true because there are silences and the conversation is not mm. necessarily that. Um, mm. But, you know, it's a story kind of also making sense or a whole, you know, some, something um, yeah. redemptive. There's this whole thing, you know, that can an interview some of the survivor's narrative? Are there redemptive narratives? You know? Well, I ha you see, I hate redemption. <laughs> of course, yeah. And I also hate people say, well, it must be very cathartic for you to go back to Vienna and see your book yeah. there, or cathartic to know that there's an exhibition of the work, or cathartic. It's not, isn't not remotely about catharsis. It's got nothing to do with catharsis at all. Catharsis means the end of something. It's a, it's a kind of wonderful, glorious kind of, da da, we're all back together again, kind of sound of music kind of thing. It's not. It's mm. nothing to do with catharsis. What it is to do is just moving something on a bit, just moving on a bit, so you can see it in a different light. And whether that's a family story fractured family story, where you can see the silences in a different way, or an exhibition or a whatever. It's just, yeah. But it's all about, when we think about the awareness of loss yeah. in some way or the other, yeah. whether it's, yeah. or change, call it loss or change. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and, y you know, um, So, um, you know, that, that leads you to diaspora, which is a very powerful, a powerful condition. It's an active condition. Diaspora isn't an end of things where people end up in different. It's it's a it's a continuing movement towards, you know, towards this place from somewhere. You know, it's it's got. Sorry, I'm, yeah, I'm no. talking. I'm talking in images, but uh, and I'm waving my arms. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> that's how, but you. But that's how. It, for, for, that's how I understand it. Yeah. No. I. I mean, one of my thoughts was also, you know, whether there is a difference actually between a Sephardi and Ashkenazi experience, yeah. because mm. there is a sort of a Sephardi experience mm. of moving across countries yeah. within empires, within languages, yeah, that yeah. sort of thing. 
Well, Ashkenazi is a more longer time in yeah. relation to state yeah. Yeah. nationalism. And yeah. that's quite different in some way. Yeah, know? yeah. I mean, there were... I, I, you see, I think... Well, you, you very astutely call me up on whether or not... I'm, I'm trying not to make vast, generalised statements. And, of course, I am doing that. So I, I will... I think there are different there are different experiences. There are profoundly different experiences. It's just the experience yeah. of dislocation in yeah. a way. Yeah. It, you know, yeah. Again, I'm not like, I, it's yeah. quite a complex. It's question. a very complicated thing. Yeah. Um, it's but it, and it matters. I mean, that's that's the end of any sentence, isn't it? Is is looking is looking um, forensically mm. at the at the particular experience of that person, their family, their community, you know, and going back like that. Mm. Um, still have a little bit of time, so what I wanted mm. to maybe to end with is the notion of, and you talk about it at the mm. end of your book, um, the letters to Commando, is the notion of witness. Mm. And you write about the home as a witness, so, mm. of course, the, you know, in terms of Holocaust memory, yeah. the notion of witness is very important. Um, and by telling your story hmm. through art or narrative, do you feel that you are a witness and also that the process makes the reader or the visitor, you know, does it make them witnesses? I hope so. I mean, I really hope so. Um, you know, there's a sort of... There's a sort of, um, sort of desperate hope that somehow you can make, you know, make a family and the way they live vivid enough that that you begin to empathise and understand that they really lived, you know, and that's whether it's my family in Vienna or these cousins in Paris, that, that actually it's not just, it's not just another, 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 but they actually, these were, they really, they were really, there. they were there. You know, and you kind of, I, not you, I mean, I'm just talking about myself, I, I desperately hope that when you do it well enough, you can just make it work, you know, and then, and then, and and that's enough. You know, that's that's work. But you said the hundred thousand of your books are now given free in, in Austria and Vienna yeah, yeah. to people. So that's an amazing thing. I mean, the the, the 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 craziness of this book, which was published first edition here for three thousand copies. You know and was turned down by lots of publishers. There is, quotes, there is no market, uh -huh. market for Jewish memoir. You know, it has now almost two million copies, 30 languages. Did it surprise you? Of course it surprised me. I mean, it, it continues to surprise me every single day. I mean, how can you ever think that, that something would happen like that? And it's overwhelming, and, it's, and it brings with it responsibility because you know and connection to other people um, and a connection to to a whole set of concerns and um, values and projects you know so it it's it's not it's not straightforward but but it's also is a I just think of my grandmother and think you know, I hope she's pleased. <laughs> I hope she's pleased now. <laughs> yeah, no, I find it interesting because it's very important that you said it was a, from a personal, you know, that mm. it was about your father. Yeah. Your, you know, and that again, so many people will be able to identify with that. Yeah. That yeah. It's trying to make sense of something. Yeah. Know, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't a commissioned book. Yeah. No one said, why do you go off and spend seven years and write about this lost Jewish family. No one said that. It was just like an imperative, but an imperative. But that, that imperative is what you keep encountering 
which is, I'm sure, I'm guessing, I'm making an educated guess here, the, 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 is that there's an imperative to understand something which is not understandable, which is incomprehensible. And then there's a different imperative, which is equally difficult, which is what do you do and how do you pass it on? And I, both those things are very different, but they're both huge drivers of, of, of anxiety and um, pain and passion and anger and lots of things. Question of how to remember, or you know, I yeah. don't know whether you have any views on Holocaust education, or you know, how that's a big question, isn't it? How well, you don't build memorials, you don't build memorials, no. Okay, let's why not? Um, you, you, the, 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 you do things like you don't the Imperial War Museum, you have extraordinary, powerful, immersive heartbreaking, real education, sort thought through experiential things. You don't necessarily build I'm, another memorial. So you're talking about the, the current yeah. one next yeah. to the Western state. Yeah. You're yeah. not in favour? Not in favour at all. But then I'm spending some of my time arguing that the Karl Luger statue in Vienna should be, should be removed. So, you know, where am I with statues? Where am I with memorials? I think I'm, I'm, there's this whole um, necessary act of remembering, of the, of the act of remembering, which I don't think is necessarily helped by a big memorial. I think it, it's helped by by encountering people and, and exhibitions and literature and art, and all kinds of things. Anyway. Okay. Um, is there any, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts, um, is there any message you have for anyone who might watch this in the future, based on your experiences? keep going actually wherever you are in your own journey of exploring attempting to pass something on just it's worth it you know I know it's really hard but keep going I think that's the only thing I'd say I'm just going to finish it. Are you, you mentioned your children. Are they interested in, in the stories at, at this point? Or? Powerfully so, yes. Yes, and they've been with me on many of these journeys as well. So, no, I think they... And they're all going off in their own ways into the world, which I look at with great happiness, actually. And then they'll make sense of it in, in their way. They really will. I've got no anxiety about them finding their way through this complicated inheritance. Because also what you said before, you know, the book about multiple identities. I'm thinking maybe, say, our generation is freer to have these different identities. Yeah. Why, mm. well, yeah. parents, you know, they wanted to be English or they wanted to... Or what, mm. Because my mother too worried to be openly Jewish or you know yeah. whatever. Yeah. But now hopefully yeah. we can have different yeah. identities. I think so. I think so. And I think that you know this digital space that you're sending this off into allows uh, also allows a freedom of aspiration and and connection, um, I, which might be you know. I'm, I hope that they will all end up looking at the ar in the archives, <laughs> in the museum, and getting all that the trays with their gloves on and all that kind of stuff. But they'll also have all this, yeah. you know, which is an extraordinary thing. Yes, to we, have. we have, you know, we have found people who come through digital connections. Mm. Somebody wants to put the Stolperstein yeah. somewhere. Mm. They Google the name of the family. They don't mm. have much information in mm. their town. Mm. They come to the archive, and suddenly they have a story. Yeah. And yeah. that story, the person who is on that Stolperstein, yeah. the pupils of that village can now connect to yes. the story yeah. of the person. Yeah. Yeah.
That's yeah. Just of a digital yeah. 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 And how powerful is that? And you see, that, you see, that's a memorial that works for me. I mean, that really does. I find that unbelievably powerful. Every time. Yeah. The other memorials you mean are sort of too too big, too abstract, too. They're didactic. Mm. They're not experiential. Yeah, because I mean, there's anyway a lot to yeah. be said because memorials is in a way, you know, what you're talking about fragments and making things visible. That's mm. very different, isn't it? Mm. So memorial is sort of mostly has a clear message or mm. does they have the complexity? I don't know. Maybe there are some memorials which are there anything? You I, well, I think I think Berlin. Know? I think Berlin is extraordinary. I th I find that hugely moving. The but, but the plan, the yeah. But also the book burning one as well. I mean, the one in, I can't remember um, which place, the one, which one? F the one for the book burning as well, yeah. which is extraordinary. Um, but... Um, anyway, for another conversation. Keep, yeah, let, another time, another okay. hour. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think we are, you have, you're going to speak now. And I think the, not now, you are half now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so I've, much. I've, it's been a terrific experience. Thank yeah. you so much for asking Thank me. You. And really, I'm glad I, it made me read your, your second book. So I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much.